we look, our world is facing a huge range of unprecedented challenges. So if you're a leader right now, how do you navigate your way through this? How do you make decisions in the teeth of so much uncertainty? How are you going to reconnect your people and rebuild your team so that they're fit to face the future? And what does it even mean to be a leader in such an increasingly challenging world? These and other questions I've been putting to top business leaders from across Europe, and I've had some surprisingly candid responses. So why don't you join me, Nisha Pele, for the latest episode brought to you by Sherpany of The Agenda. My guest today has been described by the Financial Times as one of the 50 most influential businesswomen in the world. When she moves into a position, she thinks from the outset about the inheritance that she would like to leave in the organization when she moves on. Well, what has she done then? Well, for seven years, she was CEO of the Swiss logistics company Panel Pina, and she rose through the ranks to take the top position. Since then, she has had board mandates at Logitech, Julius Baer, and also currently she is chairwoman of the reputed Swiss railway system. Let me introduce you to Monica Rebar. Welcome, Monica. Good to have you with us on the agenda. Thank you very much and uh, happy to be with you. So when we last spoke, Monica, you told me about an executive program you were sent on at Harvard Business School when you first took over as CEO at Panel Pina and, and what a big impression it made on you. Why was that? Tell us. Yeah, it was really an interesting story because the first thing we had to do when we arrived was the first evening they asked us to write um, what we would like to be remembered of when we would finish the job as CEO. So, and this was, of course, a, a little shock in the, in the beginning, but it was really interesting to, to, to look at what, what do I want? Because if you start something like that, you think about probably the first hundred days, which is normal, but not the whole period and not what would you like people to, 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 to remember you. And what did you want your legacy to be? What did you write down? For me, I mean, it was a, it was a special situation of the company, of course, at that time that the, the company was very much patriarchal uh, led. And I knew it was my, my job to bring the company into a new area of more with modern styles, with also modern management styles, uh, which is of course a huge cultural change. And I, I also always thought I would be the person that would lead that. And you were of course the first female CEO too at Panopina. Yes. Yeah, now, absolutely. Were you able to hold on to that vision? Because uh, I understand within a few months, maybe just six months of taking over, you had to go into firefighting mode to deal with a, a, a US Department of Justice investigation into Panel Pina with corruption being alleged and it was pretty sticky. What did you do? Yes, I mean, um, I would say to your first question, yes, at the end, I think I, I was able to do this change, the culture change, to a certain extent. On the other hand, as you said, when you when you are faced with an investigation like that, which was totally new at the time, I mean, also in, in, in Switzerland, uh, there were a few companies that already had some experience with a, with a situation like that. And uh, so it, it, we were just, going into it and 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 we had support by lawyers but in the in the beginning that was not because also swiss lawyers had not a lot of information or a lot of of know-how about how to deal with that so uh, it took a lot of of yeah of also of your of your power at the end which then of course this is a power that 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 you don't have to manage the company anymore so tell us briefly what was at the heart of these allegations and this investigation. Something about bribery, ports, Nigeria. Those are the headlines. Can you fill in some of the details? Yeah, of course. I mean, it was it, the, the court body was was a, a case in Nigeria 
So there was another company that was taken over by General Electric at that time, and they they uh, uh, alleged themselves that they did wrong. And Panalpina was the only service provider at that time. So that's of course that we were part of it, and that was how how the whole thing started. And of course, um, the the way how how. Uh, how this, these kind of things develop is, is totally normal. Uh, and we had to, we had really to, 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 um, to fight against it and to try to keep the company together during this period. So how did you manage to do that? Keep the company together, focus on the company and the employees, while at the same time having to deal with the Department of Justice in the yeah, US. I think hugely powerful body. The most important thing for me at the time was to to keep the whole thing out of the company. So we had our lawyers and I was taking care of that. But I told also my colleagues on the management board to go their way to manage to work and not that the whole company only talks about that. So this was very important. And I think so far we managed quite well. And what were the most painful decisions that you had to take when you were negotiating with the DOJ? I mean, uh, it was for sure, how far do we go? Where do we, in the, in the first instance, because you know, they started tend to enlarge the, the investigation from Nigeria into other countries. How far can we go? And then the other thing is, it's always also linked to people. And I mean, for me, uh, and I said that in the, when I was the first, uh, uh, at the first meeting in the DOJ, I said, look, I cannot change the history of the company, but I will change the future. And I will not let go people that have done probably something in a time against ru uh, uh, rules that were different at the time. But the rules will change now and there will be a lot of people that will probably not be with the company anymore. So stepping back from it for a, for a moment, do you think it's important for successful leaders to have uh, sensitive antennae, if you like, to be scanning the radar all the time for these changes in the zeitgeist, for what is acceptable behavior and what is not acceptable behavior and watching for when it changes? Absolutely. I think this is, this is one of the most important uh, jobs, I think, for a leader to, to, to uh, not only on a business side to be out there, but also on a, on a, on, on, as you said, as you call it, the zeitgeist. I mean, look, look at that. I remember in, in, uh, in, in, in the logistics business, let's say 20 years ago, all no, uh, uh, Scandinavian countries already at that time, they were very much focused on environmental subjects, green subjects. All others were doing it, but you know, not really, they didn't mean it. This has now changed. And I think everybody who had the census out there early and really looked at that is ahead of, of the, the competition today. So this is one of the examples, but I think this is a very important thing to do. So what do you think was your legacy when you moved on from Panalpina after seven years at the CEO? Did you, did you meet the goals that you wrote down at Harvard Business School? Yes, of course, because the, the, the company had changed very much in this time. And, uh, and, and not everything was, of course, perfect. Uh, as I just said, we had go, go, gone through big troubles and we also lost business and we had not recovered this business. I would have loved to do that in this, in this period of time. But it was then also the moment where I saw I cannot now do this next step. There needs a new leader to do this next step because these seven years, they were quite hard. Uh, you had to to fight you, it was a, a huge fight at the end. And, and I think that's why you are also, you're also burned a little bit. And it needs then somebody else who comes with a fresh, who doesn't see, you know, the, the other risk is that you only see risks when you have gone through such a process. 
And I think then it's really the time also to say, mm, I think it's better. Somebody with a fresh look at it takes it and takes it a step ahead. That's fascinating. So you really need some honesty asking Absolutely. yourself, am I, still, am I still the best person for the job? Absolutely. I'm convinced that this is important. We've talked about so much, Monica, dealing with a crisis. In, how do you deal with the, the flames of the crisis? Leading organizations through profound culture change. Now I want to ask you about decision making in the teeth of uncertainty. Um, you are the chairperson of the Swiss railway system mm -hmm. and COVID and the post COVID era is presumably going to lead to huge changes in the way in which people travel and use the railways. So tell us about the kind of decisions that you are wrestling with at the board and CEO level at the Swiss Railways. Yeah, uh, that's a good point because um, I don't have the crystal ball to exactly know what's going to happen because it's an in it, it was an interesting development. In the first lockdown, uh, people found it nice to stay home, but they, they wanted still to come back. Now, as this, this period of home office was at the end much longer than we all thought in the beginning, people started to get, mm, to get comfortable with it. We see this also in our own company in, in, the, in, uh, in the railway because we had about, about 15,000 people being at home office. And just, I had just recently a call with, a, with one of my, my colleagues and he said he wanted to make, he said the next team meeting we do again physically in Bern. And somebody of his team said, yeah, but then I have twice to change the, the public transportation system. And I don't want to do that. And he said, yeah, but you know what? You did this in the past. There is no change. You know, so this is a little bit, a little bit the subject. Now, looking at that a little bit broader, um, I have a lot of discussions with, uh, with managing directors, with CEOs in Switzerland, also about this subject, also with people that, that um, or, or businesses where you would say it's easy to make it from home. You really can do this. It's not a problem. I think we have to convince the people that it is important to meet also physically, that a, a good balance between physical and, and, and pure online is probably the good thing in the, in the future. Now, coming back on public transportation, first of all, how can we make the system again attractive? How can we make the system also attractive, not only for the, the commuters, the business commuters, but also for, for uh, um, your, your, your free time, your, your, if you go to do something with the family. I mean, we had, I'm not sure if this has also happened in other countries. We had in, in Switzerland, due to the fact that, um, that people were home, the bicycle had a total boom. Everybody was buying bicycles, of course, if ever possible, uh, uh, an, an electro bicycle. And now they all want to bicycle, but then go home by train. But we don't have right. enough space for all uh -huh. the bicycles. So uh, these are also things that, that we feel are changing. We still believe that the, the environmental subject will stay a subject, especially also for young people. So our discussion is on the one hand, how can we make it again more attractive uh, for people to use the railway? Because I mean, the other thing is as a, as a, a governmental owned company, there is of course a, uh, a lot of people that have an opinion about that. So all the politicians and the government and then all the regulators. So it's, it's really hard. So then what are your thoughts on diversity, which is increasingly something that organizations embrace 
um, not just gender diversity, but ethnic and geographical diversity. Yeah. What difference does it make, if any? For me, it's it's I and I'm I'm a, an, I'm hundred percent behind diverse teams from language from whatever what is possible and what makes sense for a company. The, what I always realize is the more difference you have, the better will be the decisions because you see things from different angles. We all have a different backpack that we have, that we bring from our experience. And the, the, the more of these kind of experiences you can bring into decision making, the better it is. Monica, we've talked about a number of different things during this conversation, uh, leading through a crisis, leading an organization through culture change and profound culture change at that, and making decisions in the face of uncertainty. Is there a final thought you want to leave our listeners with? Um, yeah, I think uh, we are talking about about leading and about also the all the subject that you have. So I think the most important thing is you have to want to do this job. You have to want to be a leader, be that on a CEO position or on another position. There are people, they they would never be good in this job. I think this is so much important. I have seen also CEOs that didn't want to do the job and they were suffering and at the end everybody was suffering. And I haven't seen a person so released when this person at the end said, now I'm stepping down. So I think this is one thing which is important. And then don't try to play a role. You have to be yourself because you cannot play a role 24 seven. So the more authentic you are, the more people will believe in you. Monica Reba, it's been a pleasure meeting you and your authentic self. Thank you for joining us on the agenda. Thanks, thanks very much.